Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here tonight. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective and I am really looking forward to hosting tonight's discussion about connecting with and mentoring incarcerated writers uh, and the recent publication from Haymarket Books of the sentences that create us, crafting a writer's life in prison. Um, we're excited to be hosting tonight's event in collaboration with Asheville Prison Books Program, uh, the University of North Carolina Asheville's Prison Education Program, and the Great Smokies Writing Program, along with PEN America. Uh, before we start, if this is your first time joining an event with us, Firestorm Books and Co Coffee is a 14-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on the traditional lands of Cherokee people. We are a queer and feminist collective that strives to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Um, we ship books all across the country and our entire catalog is available to browse on our website, which if you have not checked out yet, I will drop a link to in the chat. Uh, Firestorm is also a community event space. We are continuing to offer virtual events right now online, uh, both because we love reaching people at a distance um, and because we know COVID continues to be a barrier for many in our community. Tonight is actually our last event of the year, um, but for those who are interested, events will start back up probably mid-January of 2023. Um, and if you want to stay in the loop about future events happening through Firestorm, I'll also drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. Uh, a note for those who are attending in the live audience tonight, um, tonight's speakers are excited to field your questions. So if you're interested in asking anything at any point, I'm going to encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you're following along on the, on the live stream. Cool. Moving on to tonight's event. Uh, tonight's discussion is inspired by the new book, The Sentences That Create Us, and it is a roadmap for incarcerated people and their allies to have a thriving writing life um, and share it. Uh, and it draws on the unique insights of more than 50 contributors. Tonight's conversation uh, will feature a discussion between the Director of Prison and Justice Writing at PEN America, Kate Smeissner, and author and educator, Scott Branson. And we're all, we will also hear from Julie and Julian from Asheville, the Asheville Prison Books Program. Kate Meissner, as I said, is the Director of Prison and Justice Writing at PEN America, where she edited the sentences that create us, um, of which uh, 75,000, I think I heard 100,000 at one point, uh, 100,000 copies have been donated to reach readers in United States prisons. Uh, Kate's poems, comics, essays, and curation have appeared in the Creative Independent, Harper's Bazaar, Literary Hub, The Normal School, and The Guardian, among others. Scott Branson is a queer, trans, anarchist writer, artist, translator, community organizer, and teacher. Scott is the author of Practical Anarchism, A Daily Guide, and is currently working on a book about the institutionalization of queerness for Duke University Press, as well as a book on trans anarcho-feminism. So stay tuned for those. Um, they also contribute to the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist radio show and podcast. Asheville Prison Books is a volunteer-run collective which has distributed free literature to people incarcerated in the Southeast since 1999 and currently distributes books to North and South Carolina. 
Tonight's event was also organized in collaboration with the Great Smokies Writing Program and UNC Asheville's Prison Education Program. Um, Lily was going to be here tonight, uh, but unfortunately uh, is sick this week. I think they're on the call. So if you're there, Lily, hey, um, hope you're feeling better or will feel better soon. Uh, and I'll just share a little bit of information about both those programs. Um, so the Great Smokies Writing Program offers opportunities for writers of all levels to join a supportive learning community in which their skills and talents can be explored, practiced, and forged under the careful eye of professional writers. Uh, the program is committed to providing the community with affordable university-level classes led by published writers and experienced teachers with each course carrying academic credit awarded through UNC Asheville. Uh, for folks who are interested in learning more, you can find more information at greatsmokies.unca.edu and I'll drop that link in the chat. UNC Asheville's prison education program sees past the present to a post-carceral carceral society achieved through in, intentional educational opportunities grounded in anti-racism and trauma-informed pra practices. The program offers high quality liberal arts education to students in carceral institutions in Western North Carolina, collaborates with community partners in developing resources to ensure those students' uh, educational success post-release, designs and delivers educational opportunities for children and families of justice-involved individuals, and advocates for education-related reform in criminal justice. Uh, you can learn more at prisoneducation.unca.edu. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much to both the Great Smokies Writing Program and UNC Asheville's Prison Education Program for collaborating on organizing this event tonight. Um, and with all that said, I am going to go ahead to and pass it over to Kate to kick us off with the discussion. Ash, thank you so much. What a wonderful and clear and maybe a little bit um, exaggerative intro to me, at least. We have 75,000 copies we're distributing uh, in U.S. prisons for free, and we've distributed about uh, 38,000, uh, give or take, so far. So we have more. So if you are interested in this book as a resource for folks inside, you can request for individuals or classroom sets uh, at our website that, I, that can be dropped in the chat. It's pen.org backslash sentences that create us. And it is quite a gift to be here tonight with Scott, whose bio is so cool. I'm intimidated, Scott. I'm very excited to talk with you. Julie and Julian, looking forward to hearing from you. And before we start, I just want to say a big thank you to my colleague, Moira Marquis, who put this together tonight. Moira, if you're out there, thank you. I also have a bit of a cold, so you might see me dabbing at my nose. Thanks for bearing with. But uh, I'm here to talk about one of my favorite things, which is writing and writing in carceral settings. A little context for everybody tonight. If you're not familiar with this book, this is an old advanced review copy, but it does the trick to hold up uh, in my apartment tonight. And this is uh, one of the most exciting, to me, projects that exists, of course, because I edited it, but also not because I edited it, because the contributors in the book are brilliant and astonishing and astounding. I think what's really important to share contextually about this, uh, about this project is that um, it's not just a book on how to write, though it certainly is a book on how to write. It was a book that was inspired by uh, a resource that PEN America had for 50 years before I came into the picture. The program was founded in 1971 on the heels of the Attica uprising, a fact that I'm very proud of. And for years, the small handbook for writers in prison was sent to thousands of writers across the US for free. It became almost like a cult classic, passing hands and old resource guides and libraries. And I used to get it for my students when I taught inside. And when I came into the job a few years ago, after really looking at the mail and what was coming in, I started to understand that people really wanted to know much more than uh, how do you write a poem. They wanted to really understand what does it mean to be a writer? What are the many ways to be a writer in the world? And some of those uh, questions would come through, you know, questions I wanted for myself. How do I get an agent? Well, great question. <laughs> I want one too. Uh, or how do I copyright my work? Or 
Um, you know, I have this dream of being the next big Stephen King bestseller, but we'd have to dash some dreams. So I started to think about the people that I knew in my community, uh, mostly justice involved writers and thought, what would a book about writing behind the walls really look like? And it, it came down to really five adjectives, instructional, aspirational, inspirational and historical four adjectives to describe the contents of the book. The book begins with a section about creative writing. So it's long chapters on genre, nonfiction, poetry, et cetera, written deep dives, um, written by an array of writers, some with justice involvement, some not. It moves into my favorite section, which is uh, crafting a writer's life in prison, which looks at a series of, of people's experiences, first person narratives about exceptional things they've done from behind the walls, how I wrote and staged a play in prison, how I got my book published from prison, how to write a cover letter, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> excuse me. And the final section before a series of resources is about building writing community behind the walls. So it, Scott, maybe actually you can jump in. You've read the book. So is there anything I'm missing in sharing about it before we jump into our dialogue? Uh, I don't know if you're missing anything, but I could sort of attest to the experience of of reading it. Um, it's it's such a wonderful resource that contains so much. It's like, you know, I don't know how many pages. It's like 300 pages, but it feels, it's like a whole world in here of information. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it's helpful to any kind of writer, um, but especially it's like geared towards people who are, are in writing on the inside. And I think that's really important just to kind of like focus on that perspective there's like so many different exercises you can do in here I really love also the section on building community because it it, it shows some like organizing experience of like people putting together um groups to write with or to you know to tell stories to or, or whatever ways to kind of connect um so yeah there's just so I mean I've I've read through this a few times now and I'm just like I you could this would be like a really am amazing um companion and if someone is you know, uh, in a situation where they aren't having connections or being able to make community, this like provides um, a little bit of that, I think. Yeah, I love that you say that. And and I think also that that brings me to just sharing a little bit more about this conversation, the background of this conversation as well, which is PEN America has had for many, many years, decades now, a mentor program with working writers being in conversation with writers on the inside through the walls. So we run that. We have a couple hundred people every year that partner with, with incarcerated writers to work on their work. And uh, Moira, who I mentioned earlier, is working on an incredible project to build an extensive curriculum on how you lead a writing group. And it's it's built with uh, longtime prison educators and um, I think four formerly incarcerated folks who taught writing on the inside, including the person who wrote the essay on building writing communities in this book, Z. Kelly Aguirre. And that will become a basis for a curriculum that will eventually be available for public consumption, but we're piloting it across 20 programs across in prisons across the US, working with an institutional ally, usually a librarian, but the, really the goal is self-determination of incarcerated people to be leading their own groups and gaining this knowledge and passing it down. And it will become a training module down the line. So we're really targeting exactly what you're saying, programming deserts where people are not coming in and teaching. And really with the idea that, um, that folks have a lot of self-agency to offer and, and you don't always need an, why would you need an outside person always? There's plenty of talent behind the walls. Yeah, I I love that the sharing of the resources and like making, you know, something that's replicable for people in different contexts. That um, but you know, with that sort of like I, I think it might be interesting to start talking a little bit about the relationship with people, um, you know, these mentors on the outside and people on the inside. Um, you know, when there's people facing such um intense oppression and and we have the situation of mass incarceration it might seem like that's not a big uh, relationship between a writer on the outside and a writer on the inside, but um, I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about what you think that intervention is when in that kind of mentoring relationship. I think it's a great question and, and, and I'm curious for your thoughts as well, but I, you know, I do get a sense sometimes that it feels like it can be a not enough scenario, but what I like to remind people, and I especially remember this when I teach, tomorrow I'm going into a prison that's using this book and I'm excited to, because it's been since last December that I've actually been inside a facility. Not that I'm ever excited to go into a prison, but I'm excited to commune with the people there. And 
I think what gets lost sometimes the translation is just how isolated people feel and disconnected from the outside world. So even as something as small when I walk into a prison with a pink sweater on is that burst of color is something refreshing. <laughs> and I and I think about that when we do this through the walls work because it's a similar idea. There's somebody on the outside who's bringing me a taste of the outside world, bringing me into their world, valuing my contributions in a rigorous dialogue around my work. There's, there's multiple tiers, I think, of what it does for somebody's humanity, sense of community, sense of connection, uh, which I think is the basis really for everything else on top of that. Those relationships are what parlay into social action. That's what politicizes people behind the walls often, and sometimes politicizes people on this side of the wall, or often politicizes people on this side of the wall, having a direct relationship with somebody where they understand the impact of what the carceral setting is and does. and. I, I, I don't think human connection can be underestimated. And one of the things that I'm really proud of in our program and, and what we really strive for in, in creating these apparatuses for people to connect to the walls, I, a long time ago came to this phrase that sort of described it for funders. What we do is not, I don't see it as charitable, I see it as connective. What we're doing is building a web and using the literary community and writing as a kind of microcosm of the world we wanna see. How do we get people into equitable partnership? How do we get people into relationship? And how do we get people to uh, to get the resources that they're, they're cut off from, not having the internet, not having access. Then comes all the secondary and tertiary benefits like, oh, somebody writes a piece on a political topic and it gets published. Well, that's coming directly from the source. What does that do? Mm -hmm. so, so those are some of the ways that I think that the intervention happens. And it's on this, what seems to be a really small scale, but the ripple effect I think is pretty tremendous from what I've seen incarcerated writer often blossoms in their writing career, uh, brings other people into the fold, starts to develop relationships in the prison with their new knowledge. Folks on the outside start to get incensed around this person I now care about and has massive talent is in this oppressive system. I Hold on a second, let me advocate against this. So I, I think that that's sort of how it all occurs. What do you think? Yeah, um, I mean, I just probably add some thoughts to what you're saying, because I agree with what everything you were saying. Um, but one of the ways that prison function is through that silence and invisibility, um, like you're saying, so just that making contact, I think is politically important, and it shouldn't be sort of downplayed. Um, also, uh, sort of in addition to what you were saying, since prison works through incapacitation of people having the contacts who have access to resources that they can help um uh you know share is is another like like real material act um and i was thinking you know like I, I think you kind of alluded to this but if we think from like an abolitionist perspective there's a history of like writing as a as a tool for um communicating like the the need and desire for freedom um you know from narratives of people who have been enslaved uh you know, I think that sometimes I think that there's like a kind of white perspective on that, that like writing proves humanity. I think there's something maybe more powerful there, like that is not necessarily playing the game of like getting people to uh, have empathy or sympathy, but like that the writing itself gives voice to the terror of the prison and it bridges these gulfs, like you're saying. Um, and then also like I, one thing I was thinking about is just how it, it brings, um, it broadcasts differences and allows for connection through those differences rather than like being like I I know this experience if you're talking to someone who hasn't been incarcerated so like going through the walls is sort of like a part of breaking down the walls if it's not actually doing it in uh total and the other and like one final thought I had was just thinking about how like I mean really even if you never share your writing with anyone writing isn't really private you know it's like it's written with some with another person in mind uh, even if it's like an imaginary interlocutor. So I think like that is is powerful to to be read, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that that all of that is spot on, Scott. And I, I think uh, art generally uh, helps us imagine new futures. I think people closest to the problem often have the most interesting and nuanced solutions. And I, I there was something else you said that I, I wanted to comment on. What was it? Um, oh, it was good. Oh, it flew out of my brain. I should be taking notes as you talk. But I, I think there's really, there's really something to be said also around 
writing in one's own voice, talking about the white perspective on writing, I think is what, what sparked me to think about this. There's an essay in our book by Alejo Rodriguez, who's an amazing friend of mine who served 33 years, I believe, and while in prison, became hyperactive in the community and now is an advocate. And the piece is about how poetry training can be used as advocacy. And he starts with his own story of, of uh, going up to the parole board 13 times, trying to get his sentence reduced and failing and failing and failing and failing. And finally, he, he went back to that poetic voice that was actually kind of clowning on a, a, a romantic poetry class he had. And he went back to his own voice that he developed kind of in opposition to that class, really using the voice of the streets he was raised in and, and his own um, you know, sense of self. And boom, he makes the parole board that 13th time. Wow. And then he goes on to really detail how writing can can go beyond just even the personal, uh, you know, the professionalism. A, I want to be a writer, capital W, and also beyond just the humanization and into really how do I leverage this power? And I think reading and writing in prisons is in anywhere, but I think literacy, I think literacy is power. And that doesn't necessarily, I don't think, mean knowing all the grammar rules, though certainly that is power when you wanna move through institutions especially, but also a sense of self and a sense of being able to articulate in whatever language or voice that is, who you are and how you redefine yourself. So I think all of these, we're kind of looking always at a, at a individual liberation level that then plays into a collective, which is, which is actually a really good place to transition, I think it's a question I have for you, which is just generally speaking with all of the work you've done, what is your understanding of the role that arts plays in our collective liberation as a people? I often have to admit, I struggle with this question because I, I both think, oh, art, what, come on, are we just still trying to be artists? And then simultaneously I think, well, what else is there for me but art that keeps me alive? So I'm always on the line of this. So I'm very curious what you have to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like an it's an old um, debate about whether art is like politically useful. But there's also that there's a, an old song and slogan about how um, you know we want um, bread for all and roses too. Um, it's not like a struggle just for bare survival, but like a struggle where the kind of luxuries and pleasures and um, uh, aren't hoarded by a few and that like that that art and pleasure wouldn't be scarce that everyone could enjoy it um but also I think like even more practically art is necessary for collective liberation because uh we get stuck in our inability to think and imagine uh things other than otherwise than they are right um and uh and you can practice that in in making art in various kinds of forms right like it could be a sci-fi novel that totally builds another world. I think even within sort of abstract art or experimental poetry, there's there's you're breaking the sort of ways that we we our our minds habitually think. Um, and there's like a, a practice in in it for like you know I'm thinking about this in particular just for like um, empowering people on the inside to write that like the practice of writing, the practice of trying these things out. Um, is like it's like using your your mind and imagination in a way that's against the the um against the grain. Um so I think like the other the other thing here that I really love about the book just to tie it together with the book is that like you know while there are these questions of like how can this be useful in terms of like having a writing career or getting published or or also just for like making you know like you're saying advocating for uh parole or 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 whatever um I think that um there's also like this like there's a lot of room in the book for exploration and empowering people to like like you were saying discovering a voice which i think is itself a way of kind of undoing the hierarchies and in the writing world there's a lot of ingrained hierarchies like the sort of way the models that we have of teaching writing through the kind of workshop method is is uh and all the rules that come with that i think often stifle people um and this book doesn't take that approach it, it like allows for there to be so many different ways to write um and so many different like places where that writing goes whether or not it is like published or like you know adapted into a 
hit TV show, show or whatever. Um, so like, I think in that act itself, there's a way of like undoing some of those oppressive hierarchies that we have ingrained. And I just really appreciate that aspect of the book because it's also the way that I approach teaching writing is like, first things first, like I'm not gonna tell you rules, you figure out what works for yourself. I'll, I'll give you like feedback and a lot of attention and like support as you um, as you practice and find your voice. And that doesn't necessarily even need to be your personal voice that you need to like express your innermost thoughts, but just like something that works for you for writing, right? As like a kind of tool. Yeah, I so, I, I think that's 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 really spot on, and and something something that I also love about the book too is there's so many different perspectives, and it's like a toolbox, right? So it really goes to what you're saying. You pick and choose your ingredients and what resonates. There's a, there's a section on grammar, you know, people really want to know about grammar all the time in prison. They're doing legal work, right? So there's a practical and useful element to this about someone's literal freedom. Um, and I also see, I've seen plenty of people also get out of prison because they have had someone write about their case or they've been writing and they've used that as, as evidence of their rehabilitation, so to speak, which we know isn't not institutionally driven, but really driven by a person's need and desire to, to, cr to create their life, to keep living. And I think, I think on a very basic level, when we think about prison, and if you've ever been, ever been inside a prison or ever seen one on TV where sometimes they look real and sometimes they don't, but often they do. And you think about the gray walls, you think about the food, you think about the lack of contact, you think about the uniforms. When you talked about roses earlier, it really resonated with me because beauty is um, actually one of my driving ethics. And just a quick side note story, this book cover, when we first got the drafts back from the publisher, bless them, I love Haymarket, so proud to be on Haymarket. Um, but their designers took a tack that you would imagine. The, the book looked like prison when it came back. It had images of prison on the cover. And I said, you know, I get it. But I don't want to send a book about writing personal liberation and, and maybe more liberation, collective liberation through writing into prison that looks like prison. Why would I send prison into prison? I said, G can you give us a shot to do it in house? And, and blessedly, they said yes. And actually, I co-wrote with our designer at PIN America a piece on Lit Hub about designing this cover and this story. I said, how does writing get out of prison? It gets out of prison through the mail. And a butterfly, you know, is a symbol in so many social justice circles, but often used in prisons to also represent freedom. So I, so we went and scanned literal mail that we got, it set stacks of in our office and made these butterflies that are flying out of the walls. And I think we're in an era where there's a lot of danger right now around literature in a way there hasn't been, I don't think, in the past number of decades on this level. Like it's really reached a fever pitch. But a number of years ago when we weren't here yet, I often thought about, you know, is writing edgy anymore? You know, just in my own little, like, you know, self-questioning about myself. And I said, there's one place where writing is still really dangerous and that is in American prisons. It's, it's heavily censored. People can go to the box for their writing. Solitary confinement can lose their jobs. I mean, it really, the folks in this book who took on writing did it knowing the tremendous risk. And so I think about what, how that ties into other political movements, how we think about um, the sort of underground community that's forming. You mentioned that there's community in this book. When I was editing it, I, I noticed when it all came together that names echoed throughout the text. And that really sort of was a wonderful surprise that it wasn't surprising once I discovered it, but I didn't set out for it. I start to notice that there's, that there is an underground community and a constellation forming. And part of it is through much of it is through writing and text because that's how would people even know of each other in other prisons otherwise they would never unless somebody on the outside alerted them or they they discovered it in writing and so you mentioned that the the, the building the writing collective piece also has some tenets of organizing and and yes it sure does <laughs> and i think so there's there's a way in which also that the community creation around art is what i think also really builds towards our collective liberation you know, how do we, and there's a great line in that essay that says, you know, writing collectives aren't something like, uh, writing collectives aren't collective hallelujahs, you know, we all know each other, but we're all here for the betterment of our craft, we're here to push each other, and that is, you know, that's a, a super bonding force, you know, to be in collaborative community that way. 
Yeah, you know, thinking about that, I, I, I wanted to ask you about sort of like the sharing of experiences. And I wonder, and like, because this is something that gets talked about in a few different pieces, you know, processing trauma, also like f- attempts to find accountability or repair, also like the kind of empowerment and uh, expressing like rage and anger. Um, those are all like very sensitive things. And, and, you know, there's also so much stigma and shame around um, the, around being incarcerated and like sharing that with the world at large. So I wonder if you had thoughts just, um, you know, maybe from the position of being a, a educator on the outside, um, like kind of holding space for that difficult kind of material that might come from writers on the inside. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I think it's a really layered question, actually, when you start to dig into it. On the surface level, I think all of us pedagogically and intellectually would like to just leave it at something as simple as, well, in this space, you know, people write what they want. We don't police it. We're not judges. These are the kind of things that folks who teach on the inside, you know, come to say, and and, and in part because they're held by the prison. I, I mean, there's a, there's a reality in that that kind of privilege to say that is because you're in a policed environment where there's no risk. When you start to get out into the world and have to make decisions about what you're, actually this is something that we do when we educate young people in our work a lot is we pose these really difficult questions. If, if you were an editor of a magazine and you had a piece like this, blah, 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 you know, what, what would you choose? Or how do we create equity without pandering to people? And all of these things kind of get mashed up together. And I think I think it's a case by case basis often, but some of the things that I think about are what it takes for someone to get their work in the world and being able to stand behind that, but also understanding that you might have a wild card and somebody might still be actively harming somebody else. And how how are you gonna respond to that? I don't have an answer to it. I just know it's come up. Um, I think there's also a question of when people are open and vulnerable, are they getting the support they need on the other end? How much can you actually hold space? I'm I'm giving you challenges, not solutions yet. So bear with me. (laughs) I think about, you know, the impetus to look up or want to know what someone was in prison for. We kind of admonish that, but the reality is it's a very human line of questioning. What did you do? You know, it's human curiosity. And and certainly prison has created an apparatus of intrigue around that by its, right? (laughs) Don't talk about it-ness. And I used to have a really hard line about all this stuff. And I think over the years, I've become much softer in my approach. So when thinking about working through the walls and dealing with crime and people who've committed crime and and sometimes heinous crime, um, this is a space in which I would like to think that we create a kind of suspended reality. But the truth is that people do come up in the space and say, I can't work with this person who is a pedophile or went to prison for this. I have kids. And there's a dialogue, of course, about we only see one side of the story. We don't know the full deal. This is what we do in our program. But ultimately, if that's somebody's hard line, that's somebody's hard line. And I can't argue with it. I think these are some of the most confounding questions of humanity. So I think, you know, what it looks like, you know, for me or what it has looked like for me is really trying to understand where people are coming from. Actually, and but I wanna read something from a writer named Elizabeth Hawes because I think she really lays it out in a short paragraph so clearly. And mm. me bumbling around trying to answer this question and going all over the map um, is probably less helpful than hearing from her. And it, you mentioned it in the book, You know, John J. Lennon, who's a, a powerful journalist, a really highly published journalist from prison, uh, writes about that he writes what his crime was right in his cover letter, gets it out of the way. He's like, this is part of the deal. You know, I have to put it out up front. But there are other people who, who uh, I think it's a much harder question for. So, and this is why, this is why. So Elizabeth Haw says, every time a prisoner submits their writing into the public sphere, they're subjecting themselves to an audience who can easily look them up and be told a prosecutor's version of a story, true or untrue about their conviction. This is in juxtaposition to all a prisoner desires, to put the past behind them, to lay low and quietly merge back into society, to reconnect with those they love in fresh circumstances. Writing as a prisoner ties their name to the label of felon. A prisoner must ask themselves, am I willing to put myself out there to possibly be talked about again, to be judged again? And more importantly, is this story play poem idea worth my vulnerability? Will people listen or judge? 
while all artists and writers question the value of their work and wonder who is viewing it and how it is being perceived, a prisoner who is an artist or who writes always carries the added burden of having to apologize for their past or a piece of their past or for one afternoon of their past or for one minute of their past. So I think holding that uh, knowledge you walk into a space of education or connection saying, I want to hold that in the front of my brain and, and be sensitive to that and help somebody through the, the, the number of questions that might come up for them in their writing. Should I share about my crime? What is the reality that somebody might look me up and find out what I did? Am I prepared to take that on depending on the nature of the crime? You really might not want that. You know, somebody might not be uh, mentally and emotionally prepared. Can you do a pen name? But I think Scott, these are some of the stickiest questions that come with doing this work. You know, when we're talking about prison, we're talking about interpersonal harm, state harm, institutional harm, and historical harm, all kind of mashed up in one category. So there's, there's the holding of space to say, this is an area where I want someone to bring their full humanity to the page. I wanna know who they are outside of this label and identity that they're living with it every day. But I also wanna understand that there is a lot of unresolved trauma in the system because people are not getting the services or support they need. And so what do I have to weigh in order to do this responsibly? And again, I think sometimes there's a pandering nature to this kind of idea when people talk about people in prison like, everybody's innocent that and, and 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 I want to be careful with my words because I also share your politics and beliefs you know but I also think there's something very flattening about that kind of a narrative that kind of gets populated on Twitter where you know these are some of we, we are dealing in this space of some of the most confounding questions of humanity the root causes of violences questions that haven't been answered for centuries and so there's also a reckoning and a contending that we need to do around that part of the conversation that's major parallel to this other work we're doing. So I think that there's, there's a lot of different things that have to be held in the heart and brain. And it's mm -hmm. really becomes about, again, about the relationships. And I've had relationships I've had to end with people that were not productive or could, but got borderline abusive or manipulative. They weren't ready to be in that role. And I've had great friends that I've had for years. I mean, it's 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 a spectrum of humanity like anywhere else. So so these are the kind of I don't know if any of this came out articulately with my head cold. I'm like, blah, 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 but talk to me. <laughs> no, 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 that I think that was really well said and you made really important points because like, I mean, on one hand, that flattening that you're talking about is what creates the and it's it's sort of the way we think about identities in general. But when you like label a person as a, a felon or a criminal, like that enables us to create a population that would be expendable, right? That can can be, um, uh, you know, just like ignored or punished or, you know, um, you know, tortured in ways. But on the other hand, like you're saying that flattening can also take away from people their own uh, possibilities of like growth and change and, and accountability. Um, those, those aren't things that like you can force on someone. Um, but like, you know, from that kind of abolitionist perspective, you have, you want to in, like imagine that that's something that people can do. Um, so that, yeah, that totally makes sense to me. And I think like, uh, the translating it to the kind of situation of like writing pedagogy, like there's a, a way of, and I think this is, uh, kind of the ethos of the book. So it's important to meet people where they're at. And so like not holding them up to the standards of purity or like painting them with a broad brush, but also not like like trying to get things out of them that they're not ready to to say. Um, and and I, I uh, the last thing I, I want to just pick out of what you were saying that I think is really important is just like, and I was thinking about this in, as I was preparing for today, just like about writing in general, like not everything is for everyone. Right. Like, um, and we don't need to like, if something's not for me, that doesn't mean I have to make a rule that no one else can be, be, uh, part of it. Um, so like, yeah, if someone's not there for it, like th then they should, they should follow what they need and, uh, and you can end relationships when they don't work. Um, so I think that's just really important that like none, none like that, um, and translating just to writing, like if you write something, not everyone's going to like it. Right. But it'll have some audience and, th and that's worth it, you know? <laughs> And everybody has agency in, in this scenario, I think, is also really important holistically. You know, I think that's when we talk about sort of multi-directional and healthy relationships. 
everybody in the dynamic has agency to say this works for me or it doesn't. And that's a, that, you know, that's, that's what we're after really. And I, you know, I, I want to walk into the, the, the question of the power dynamic too, that comes up in these spaces. And I'm already noticing our time is racing away from us. I could talk to you about this stuff all day. Clearly we need part three, part two, three. <laughs> um, so in, in, in mentoring incarcerated writers, there's, you know, clearly a power dynamic that none of us can, can deny, you know, somebody's not free, somebody's free. Uh, and many folks inside have trauma related to judgment. So also what you're talking about, you know, in school and the legal system, but, you know, per, uh, particularly, I think people bring into prison often interrupted educational paths. So there's a lot of trauma around schooling and writing in general. So our, our program manager, Ravi Pollack said this, had this wonderful introduction to our 2021 prison writing uh, contest anthology this year, this quote, he says, I often tell the ironic story of how when I was incarcerated, I balked at the idea of submitting a story to Penn's contest. I refused to have my work judged by, a, by what I uncharitably imagined were privileged snooty readers. Now I am that reader. <laughs> and we laugh about that a lot five years into our work together. So I, I think a lot about, we think a lot about, and we're not always successful, um, how do we start to challenge this power imbalance? And again, like in an authentic way, not where I think sometimes a little bit of saviorism can slip into the best radical politics. So, you know, how do we really challenge this in a way that again, is not pandering or overly coddling or overly permissive or allowing boundaries to be manipulated either, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I love that quotation too, because it's it's just, it's just interesting to think about like stepping from one role into another and like what happens when you do that. And and my my like inclination is that, uh, and, I, and again, I think this is like in the spirit of the book, is that like when you have a position that has some kind of power or authority, how can you inhabit that position in a way that um, that like, again, like spreads the access and resources to other people rather than to identify with that power position and use it as leverage over someone else. And so in terms of writing, like, and in this book, there's like transparency, right? Like that's a really important thing when you're teaching people about writing. And, and when people come to like writing classes, often they really want to get something out of it. If they're there by choice, sometimes they're not, <laughs> um, you know, like there's, there's like, they have something of themselves bound up in it often. Um, and so if you like inhabit that kind of obscurity of like the, you know, the judge of a writing contest or the editor of a, uh, uh, an elite journal. And in, I mean, and anyone who knows who's like submitted writing, like that you get so many basically silent rejections that, that build up and feel horrible, like not inhabiting that role, speaking across those like spaces and, and, and sharing like your, like, just like, like kind of like opening up the hood and being like, this is how I get here. This is what, what worked for me. It doesn't work for everyone. I don't know. Just speaking about that in the kind of transparent way, I think is one of the ways that we can kind of work, um, against that. And then, and yeah, and just like, also, um, I mean, this is something I was like actually writing about a little bit today, but like, um, you know, there's that that kind of imposter syndrome thing. And I think a lot of teachers know that, like you go up in front of a room of people and you're like, how am I, how did I get here? And why would anyone believe that I have anything that is like more important to say than anyone else? Um, and there's something about that position that works for teaching that like people believe that like they could possibly learn something from you, gives you attention and stuff. But I think it's important to kind of like realize that everyone's sort of faking it, right? Um, and kind of spread spread that knowledge uh, that way so that we can sort of, yes, like I said, be in that position and also kind of outside of it in a way that turns it against that kind of hoarding of power, if that makes sense. I, I think it makes total sense. And I, I think kind of tagged onto that are two thoughts I'm thinking about directly, you know, on the other side of the coin of everybody's kind of an imposter, <laughs> we're, all, we're all imposters here together, is everyone's a teacher from a kind of spiritual perspective, so to speak, you know, everybody has something to teach. And so in, in a pedagogical sense, there's a way in which I think um, power sharing can happen, even if it's one-to-one -one mentoring. So, you know, asking somebody to develop their own writing prompts or bringing in their own knowledge, or you kick us off, you give me a writing prompt this time, and I'm going to share with you, you edit my work, you know, making yourself vulnerable in that relationship. You know, obviously that can happen in classroom spaces. 
but how does that happen in a in a one on one mentoring capacity as well? And really thinking about, I think, I mean, the power dynamic goes so deep, Scott. It goes down to, you know, I've been communicating with a writer for years now who's in the book and who I work closely with a pen, and I realized the other day I was like, I don't think this person knows what I look like, and I know what he looks like because his photos on the internet, and I, you know, just imagining that you're writing to somebody that you've never met, you have no context for, they can look you up in your crime, they know what you look like. It's, yeah. It starts, so anything you can do that reveals your your character in a way you feel comfortable with, because I also understand, of course, you know, like I said, I've, I've been in sticky situations where I've been overly trusting, understanding people have a lot of trauma. Um, but how do you make yourself real and three-dimensional and open to an exchange, you know, and, and what you can learn as well, I think I think is really important in this particular context. I mean, most classrooms, I, I would say this is something that, you know, build in some, some power sharing, collaborative teaching. And then the other point to what you're saying about recognizing your power positionality, I also think is recognizing, this is a funny thing to say, the cool factor that comes with this work for folks on the outside. There is a bragging point that I've seen, I've done in myself, if I'm to be totally honest, when I was younger around, I'm doing this edgy work, I'm in the space. It's often either subconscious or somebody would never admit to it. But I think as, as people in the work and in relationship, uh, that's something to be conscious of. You know, How does this also create my identity and how am I taking on this identity and what is doing for my ego? I mean, it's just a, a worthy line of questioning, <laughs> I, I think, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, that that totally makes sense. And I, I completely understand what you're saying. And also, like, I'm thinking about, like, the um, uh, there's a little version of that that's also, like, the kind of radical savior, maybe a little bit of the savior thing where, like, I'm going to do this to help radicalize or, like, <laughs> whatever um, people on the inside. Um, but, you know, I guess, like, imagining... A situation where that's not happening I want is wondering what you think like how it goes the other way so for a writer on the outside collaborating with a writer on the inside like what does that kind of that reader and that writer um get like bring to the table in that kind of collaboration what can a, a writer on the outside sort of take from workshopping uh in that situation their own work um or or yeah, or well, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, their own work are also, I mean, there's also um, uh, stories in here about people collaborating on texts together, which is something yeah. I was really interested in and thinking about, like, you know, two writers working together on the inside and outside at, uh, at the same time. So I don't, I mean, wherever you want to yeah. take that. I think there's a lot of that happening too. I mean, I, th I think it, ha you know, I think it happens on a lot of different levels. First of all, anybody who's taught in a prison kind of gets this teaching in prison bug because what people discover in that space is that there are folks that are just absolutely hungry for intellectual conversation, stimulation, creativity. So all of a sudden you're working with people, you've come from a high school classroom or like a MFA program and all of that ambition to be something in the world is sort of stripped away and the hunger to just be alive <laughs> and to be in community to be a conversation and to be sparked in the in the brain is it's such a gift to be around to be reminded of it takes you out of the kind of rat race that the community these creative communities often on the outside propel under the you know capitalist structure um so i think just on base level being brought down to this sort of really raw remembering of why we create in community is is the biggest gift that for me is what happened but i think also what you'll find is refreshing perspectives because there's people that are not steeped in the twitter feed of the day i think you find um a completely different life perspective one of my favorite stories actually we have a award in our mentor program for mentor pairs and it's named after Madeline Langle and Ahmad Rahman. Like Madeline Langle, who wrote, you know, Wrinkle in Time, was one of our earliest prison writing mentors, I found out in like 1972. Vanity Fair did a great article on it a couple of years ago. And she was paired with a 19 year old uh, Black Party Panther leader named Ahmad Rahman, who then two decades later came out of prison and became a celebrated professor. And we got to read their exchanges and I was a little nervous going in, you know, it's like, let's see what Madeline, and it amazed me because they were having these deeply rigorous debates 
around her characters in her book. He was calling her out on things that, you know, hey, this, I know, I know you're trying to be well-meaning and she's going, I'm, listen, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm, please give me the feedback. And here was this phenomenal exchange from this elderly white woman, you know, sitting in her ivory tower and this former black pa Panther party leader wrongfully incarcerated. And there, the, the dynamic is so rich and the learning is so multidimensional. And I think that, you know, you sp started speaking about what happens when people from different backgrounds connect through an art form. And I think that this is a, a, a major example of where it can happen. So, you know, those are just some of the ways. Those are just some of the ways, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And also just thinking about that in the um, situation of, of like teaching um, and the power structures, like if it, if it doesn't go one direction, but like you're like, you need to learn alongside the people you're teaching or else you'll just be like kind of spouting stuff at them. That's not really applicable. Right. So um, yeah, it's that, that story is really cool. I didn't, I didn't know about that. Oh my, it was, was such um, a, a, a wonderful discovery, especially finding out that it was like a good exchange. You know, you get so nervous about these things. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I, I agree completely, and I think there's um, there's also something about I think uncovering on an emotional level that somebody who has maybe done something that you would never imagine yourself being friends with someone who did something like that, quote unquote. Uh, whether you know someone has done it or not, you just don't know. There's something also about being confronted with uh, the humanity of folks that have done things that are, uh, you know, outside of your scope of reference, and what that does to somebody's honestly internal spiritual life. I actually think this book has a lot of spiritual implications. I, I kind of realized, you know, somebody's writing about watching 121 men be executed on death row, and that he writes because he's haunted. I mean, the the it, there there are people experiencing unimaginable things, both as perpetrators and victims of the system and victims before they came in, you know, these dynamics are so muddy and cloudy and mashed up. And I think that for me, as an artist, one of the most, prof and human is one of the most profound lessons that I got doing this work the past 10 years is it really jumbled up my internal compass of what I, I understood as good and bad. And that dichotomy stopped existing for me. And politically, I believed that. Intellectually, I believed that. But emotionally, I understood it with a depth I could have never understood it before. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that comes from relationship again. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, one of the things I was thinking, or I don't know if it's one thing, but I, I kept thinking about, you know, people like Audre Lorde or, or June Jordan, like Black feminist poets and um uh, focusing a lot on how, um, like, you know, the only way to get free is through those kinds of connections and, and, and across differences in particular. Um, and I think we get so, um, stuck when we think in these kinds of binaries of like good and bad, like you were saying. Um, and even if you do like theoretically believe it, like what, when do you put your money where your mouth is, you know, um, in terms of like forming these relationships. So like just that fact of like, of um, Madeline, Madeline Lingo and um, Ahmad Rahman, like having a, a connection. That's like, that's a, a potentiality that would like no one could have predicted. Um, and, and that's, I don't know, these are the sorts of, um, you know, from this kind of like liberatory perspective, I think these are the kinds of things that um, these kinds of connections are what we need to like, to create spaces for. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, that just really comes across in the, in the book as like uh, a kind of driving possibility. Possibility is one of my favorite words. And I was losing a sense of possibility with this head cold and this conversation has brought me back to life. Scott, I want to talk to you about so many more things, but I think we want to, I think yeah. we're going just a little over our transition time. So I know if you want to maybe talk a little bit of just a little bit about the power of mutual aid as a social change strategy and, and maybe use that as a way to invite our friends into the into the room, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, mutual aid is um, is a, a really important sort of like practice that creates these connections. I think that w that I was just sort of mentioning. I, I think of it in in itself as a as a kind of political action, a direct action, um, even though sometimes it seems like a small thing. Um, 
but um you know it's in these sort of small moments of like of of like sharing resources among people that don't create hierarchies that i think you can like kind of create these uh political possibilities and and, and so i just want to kind of introduce uh julie and julian from um Asheville prison books because i think that's a really good instance of a of a mutual aid project with a long running one so i would love to hear from you too <laughs> I think Julian's going to kick it off, but just wanted to say, really appreciate the conversation and being included. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting me be here. Uh, when I was incarcerated, I got into a catch-22 where I was trying to write and all you could have was a flex pen and we got a bad batch, a bad batch of flex pens. And so I couldn't use a flex pen to fill out a Scantron for commissary. And so I spent a, about a week trying to convince a deputy that I wasn't going to stab myself with a big pen if he gave it to me. And I finally got more paper and one out. Uh, I kind of wish I'd had this book when I started writing. Uh, I did six months in solitary. And for all the bad things about solitary, it's a great place to write. Although uh, when I started reading the section about hooks, in there, I was like, oh, this is why nobody's publishing my book. And I don't know, it, it's an interesting experience to write in there. Um, it led that and being able to reconnect with literature probably led me to be involved with the Asheville Prison Books Project. Um, I'm sure people who have heard me talk about at fundraisers or whatever, uh, are sick of hearing me say this, but books saved my life in there and writing saved my life as well. And I think that oh, I, I did, uh, when I was in the penitentiary, I did uh, pre-GED tutoring. And so, you know, you meet a lot of people who have bad experiences uh, in the education system, uh, you know, I know someone who can tell you all about deliberate indifference up and down better than most law professors ever could, but he can't subtract. And so he keeps staying at the same level and the same level and the same level. And it's, he, he's like, he's frustrated because he's stuck. And I think the opportunity that people have to rekindle or begin a relationship with a written word and writing and telling telling their stories um i think it can be a really powerful introduction to yourself of maybe when you've just been hustling or just living your addiction or whatever got you uh in the penitentiary in the first place and by being able to make that connection with yourself, uh, you can kind of begin getting out of, you know, you wake up in your cell every day and you're alive in the grave and you can make your way slowly through either the written word or through reading or hopefully both to, to finding a new you. And that experience for me uh led me to work with the Asheville Prison Books Project and it's why I'm still doing it. Yeah. Um so I also worked with the project. Um and I guess you know one of the things that stood out to me about the conversation before so I guess like I know Ash mentioned earlier but just to re reiterate we're a 20 plus year old group um, collective that sends free books to people who are incarcerated in North and South Carolina. Um, we send out you know, between 100 and 150 packages a month. Uh, we're all volunteer and we're all grassroots supported. And um, something that stood out to me about the conversation before was this idea, I think you said that it's like, you think of it as connective work not um, charitable work, and that connects to the idea of mutual aid. Um, and yeah, that, that is what it is. And we, this idea of connection, which I think has just really, you know, been a thread throughout this whole conversation is an important one because um, 
you know, we all, everyone who works with the project does it for, you know, maybe some similar reasons, maybe different reasons. There's personal reasons, there's political reasons and everything in between. Um, but clearly everyone who's involved in the project finds the meaningfulness and the importance um, and the necessity of that work of connecting with people inside. Um, and the medium of, of books, the meaning of re medium of reading and writing, um, because it's not just the books, right? It's also like the letters. Um, that medium is an interesting one because for all of the reasons that we've talked about or that you've talked about um, over this last hour, there is something kind of compelling and important about reading and writing and the ways that it connects us to ourselves and each other, um, to futures that we want to see and pasts that we, you know, maybe want to see in a different way. Um, so there is something compelling about it being books, but we also often will say to people like, hey, so, you know, in our volunteer events, orientations, we'll be like, okay, so yeah, we send books to prisons. Like, why do you think we send books? And people will say all of the things that have, have been talked about and we'll be like, yes, that is true. All of those things are true. And also it's the only thing that we're allowed to send. If we could send food and medical care, <laughs> we would send that too, right? And just kind of like reminding, I think it goes this idea of the mystique of, of, of reading and writing and, and the ways in which like it seemed to be this kind of like ennobling thing and how that's problematic, but also true. Um, but the reality of people who are uh, isolated and need things. And one of the things that they need is, is books and connection. Um, and that is one thing that the project can provide. Um, so that's a little about like why we do it. Um, if folks are interested in kind of like the nuts and bolts of like how it works, um, I think we could leave that to, you know, the Q and A um, where you can get at us. Um, we've got a website and email and all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, we just appreciate being able to be part of this conversation. I think also just, I'll say one last thing, um, you know, the tie-in, maybe it seems intuitive, but like, I'll just put a fine point on it. So much of writing and the desire to write comes from reading, you know? So it's just this circle, not that you have to be a reader to write, but like, let's <laughs> be honest, most people who do write a lot are also readers. Um, and so the project is just a clear, a clear connection to everything we're talking about. And also, I don't even know if we mentioned that we're one of the projects that we were lucky enough to be the recipient of many of the copies of this incredible book, and we've been sending it in. So there's also just that concrete tie-in, like, thank you for <laughs> making this available for us to make available to other people. Oh yeah, and it looks like Ash has- say, put, right. So sorry to jump in and just, just, just to really put a fine, wouldn't you say that's mutual aid because we couldn't distribute it without you, so. Boom. <laughs> also with the, just, I would say like put, spreading this book through, um, like sending this in is, is another kind of mutual aid because it's giving people like tools too. It's not like, I mean, you know, it's great to send in fiction, nonfiction and all this other stuff, but like, this is, is something that has like a lot of very practical tools that then can be used for various um, endeavors that they have, you know. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I just wanted to take a moment to thank uh, everyone, uh, Kate and Scott for that discussion and Julian for sharing your story and Julie for sharing a little bit more about prison books. Um, for folks who are still here in the audience, would love to hear from you. Um, if you have any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A there at the bottom of your screen. Um, there were some folks who submitted some things already. Um, Kelsey is here and wanted to share that they're part of um, an online and print journal called MEND uh, that celebrates the lives and creative work of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, as well as the individuals who have been impacted. Uh, directly or indirectly by the criminal justice system. Um, 
and they are currently accepting writing and submissions for their 2023 issue. Um, so folks, you know, if you click on that Q&A and you look at the answered questions, there's a bunch of information there um, that Kelsey um, submitted and you can read through that and see if it's relevant to any people that you know. Um, and it looks like Kelsey dropped their email, mendthejournal at gmail.com. Um, so just want to direct folks if you're interested in learning more about that. And there was one other person uh, who asked, they say they're not a writer, but they have a friend who is in prison and is asking uh, them about publishing a book. And they're wondering if there's spaces you recommend um, where they can get some support in the area um, because they're not an expert in publishing. And I saw that Kate's uh, recommended, uh, recommended the book here. So I'm guessing that means that some of those questions can be found uh, answered in this book as well. Yes, it does mean that. And there is a resource list in the back of publishers that are that are friendly for incarcerated uh, applicants as well, writers particularly. So it's going to depend, obviously, for your friend on where they are on their writing journey. Are they highly published and looking at, you know, you know, getting an agent and trying to get a big five publisher? Are they looking at something that's self-published? I think there's a lot of also different ways to look at that. And I think Inside Out it's not called Inside Out Writers, there is a, a newer organization that's publishing folks that are a little greener in that way that I think are fantastic. They're in the, they're in the back of the book's resource section. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Often prison work all sounds similar. <laughs> inside, outside, etc. cetera. <laughs> uh, Authorsinside dot org is, is a place that I would also start to look at, but there's a, there is a bunch in the book as well. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Scott. Well, I was just going to ask, because in the answer that you said, you can order it for free for people on the inside. Is that that's true? Like, that sounds yeah. really important. I'm go I, I dropped the link in the chat to the book's page on pen, but I'll drop it to the actual form itself. Yes, so you can send it to anyone inside through that form. Cool. Yes. That's awesome. Thanks to Moira, who I did see was on, who who makes sure that all these books get to the right the rightful place. All right, let's see. If, oh, I don't think I can send a um, I don't think I can send a link to the whole group. So if I put it in this host and panelists, maybe somebody else can drop it in for me, or I'll put it I in think, the Q and A. Yeah, I think it's I accessible in the. Sorry. No. <laughs> if you want to put it in the chat, there, I I'll, I'll make sure everybody can see it. Oh, fantastic. Um, it looks like we've got a question for the prison books folks. Looks like Julian already answered online uh, through type, but someone was wondering if there's a way for authors in the audience to do donate uh, their books to prisons. Julian, you wanted to say that out loud. <laughs> Sure. Um, you can contact a local prison books organization. Uh, there's a books to prison organization that I believe serves every state and some nationally at this point. Uh, you could contact the local penitentiary or your uh, detention center, whatever it may be. Or uh, if that's problematic to achieve, the Department of Corrections, usually um, the first two options are preferable. Yeah, and I can um, probably find a link to, to a list of the prison books projects nationally um, that Julian was alluding to. So like we said to North and South Carolina. So if you're you know, looking to get books in to a particular place. You can find a, a books to prisons group that like serves that state. If you wanna donate them to us, <laughs> we're here. If, if you're in Asheville and you wanna donate them to us, we'll, we'll gladly take them. Cool, yeah, it looks like there were a few more questions in the chat that all, all already got answered as well. Um, somebody here on behalf of Knock LA who are launching a prison reporting initiative and looking to connect with folks 
um, reaching out to, to Kate. So always love to see when, when connections are made through the, these events. I think that's- I do too. Can I take that as an opportunity to share about a couple of resources? Um, thank you, Cece, I look forward to your email. I, I, if you're interested in doing something like this, like finding writers in prison to commission or work with, there's a couple places I recommend. One, Prison Journalism Project is doing great work. They have an incredible roster of, of writers on the inside they've been working with and working to place in high level uh, environments, journalism environments particularly. Scalawag just put out on Haymarket Books, we actually funded it, an amazing guide for journalists working through the walls, how to work with people through the walls when you're hiring reporters, uh, ethically, money-wise, et cetera. And we at PEN America are working on a major project that will launch in 2023, hopefully around the summer, uh, called for now the Incarcerated Writers Bureau, which is uh, will feature about 50 to 100 of the most prevalent working writers in American prisons who are ready to be commissioned. I uh, will also have a uh, four times a year, what would that be, by month, quarterly newsletter that goes out with publishing opportunities for people looking to build their portfolio. So a way that literary journals, publications, organizations can get the call out to a wide variety of folks and also to, can encourage folks inside to submit and get that information easily. And um, we'll also be doing trainings on how to ethically and uh, logistically and practically hire and work through the walls as well through that initiative. So keep an eye on that if you're interested. Fantastic, yeah. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any further questions in the chat. I'm wondering, maybe, maybe folks are thinking about other things that they wanna ask, but in the meantime, I'm wondering if there are any topics um, included in the book or related um, that we didn't get to tonight uh, that y'all were, were hoping to discuss at some point. What do you think, Scott? Do we get to everything we wanted to get to? Did I, was I close over the notes. down my window of notes before <laughs> too early? That's what I was just uh, looking for. I mean, um, there was one thing that we had talked about with a, a, a nice quotation from um, an incarcerated writer. Um, I could sort of put that out there and see if you had some things to say about it. Um, sure. It said, uh, it's, comes from the incarcerated writer, Kevin Schaefer, who wrote, um, for years I avoided writing about prison at all. I didn't want to be a prison writer. Didn't want to accept that that might be all I was good for. The, that all things prison might really be the creative limits of my life. The material felt too close, too bleak, too crushingly monotonous. When I wrote, I preferred escaping with my imagination and all that, but everything proved so porous. Prison always seeped in, no matter how hard I tried to forget it. So I think like, um, yeah, a question, just thinking about that. I mean, one thing that comes to mind just is like when you're working with incarcerators and like, how are they, how do they relate to their um, current experience in what they're writing about, but also like maybe some thoughts about um, about how you've seen writers um, deal with like trauma, deal with the, or try to find empowerment through their writing. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's a great quote and, and I've heard many like it. There's two essays that sit back to back in this book, both of which I love. One is called uh, something, every story ends with hope, why you should write about prison or something like this, um, Derek Trumbo. And he writes about really avoiding writing about prison and his experience and then being in a playwriting class and and opening up and the camaraderie and the, the intensity of shared experience in the room and how meaningful it was for his peers that he took that leap out of, you know, their, their fake SNL skits or whatever they were writing. And then next to it is an essay by a friend of mine, Justin Monson, who is a poet incarcerated in Michigan. And he has a beautiful meditative essay. It's actually where the title of the book came from. It's something, has a long title. And one of the things it says is, and the sentences that create them. And he writes about how conf exactly that, metaphorically, how confined he is to this voyeuristic write to me about your prison life, which he did. He has a brilliant manuscript that I'm really proud to say Haymarket picked up that's coming out in 2023 um, uh, that is largely about prison. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. 
And on some level, I think he understands, I know he understands that he was leveraging that in this moment in time. This is something people are interested in as well. And there's, there's kind of a double-edged sword in that as well. I think what I see a lot of, mostly what I see is people writing about prison because it's the condition of their lives. And there's a way in which I think we've created these stories to seem as if they're niche. But when you look at the numbers of people incarcerated, 2.3 million, not to mention people on parole, probation, justice involved, their families, their friends, communities. This is an American story at this point. So, you know, there's also a way in, a way in which the outside world has yet to catch up to that reality. So that creates, I think, kind of an interesting rub in, in looking at it from a literary perspective. But I often, it's a, it's a debate we've had with our prison writing committee as well, who judges our contest. When we first came on, we said, do you favor stories about prison? And people had different views on it. Some people said, yeah, it's the prison writing contest. And some other people said, no, you know, I don't wanna to have to pigeonhole people to write about certain things. But um, the world that I, I hope we walk towards is where folks are able to write about whatever they want. And that that is something that I think any identity craves, right? There's a a sense of freedom that we want to access personally in our art. But I think that folks that are uh, have been locked up or are on the inside are up against a, a, a real battle with that because of the way that our society doesn't want to forget, forgive, can, you know, we kind of condemn forever, even when people come home. So I think, I don't know if I'm answering your question about dealing with trauma and writing. Certainly I read tr trauma-induced things all the time, <laughs> yes. But I think there's an opportunity for folks like this on this call to be thinking about what spaces we're making, how we create both spaces that are for this lived experience, but also the alternative, which is, you know, publishing incarcerated writers without it being about prison, without it being a prison issue, without it being a prison centered event, having it just enter your larger literary community as another member. And I think that starts to open up space for people to, to um, figure out other ways in which writing can serve them, you know, but, I, but, but yes, I see a lot of that and it's helpful and meaningful and makes sense. I don't know if I answered the question at all. I went all over the map. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think that was great. And without any more questions from the audience, perhaps that is a good place to, to wrap up for the evening. Um, so gosh, thank you all. Um, I just want to say anybody uh, who registered for this event, um, you'll get a follow up email uh, with a with a link to watch the recording. Um, so this was, you know, a really kind of exciting event for us to host, uh, because it serves as a resource, uh, not just tonight, but in the future for folks uh, to be able to connect with and work alongside uh, folks, you know, as, as Kate said, sort of like inside, outside some of this terminology. Um, and yeah, we're excited to offer that. So thank you so much um, to Kate and Scott and then Julian and Julie from Asheville Prison Books. Um, hope folks who are local are able to connect with them uh, to get involved in some of this work. There was also, um, the Great Smokies writing program and UNC Asheville's prison education program that helped to organize this event tonight. So thank you to them. Um, yeah, and re really appreciate you all taking the time to do this tonight. Thanks so much for letting me be part of it. And thanks, Kate, for, you know, putting this book together. It's such an amazing resource. Um, and, uh, and also thanks to Julian, Julian, for the work that you're doing with the prison books. Thanks for having Thank us you. on the call. And and sorry to kind of hook it at the end, but I realized we didn't maybe do a great job of explaining how folks can get involved with the program. So would it be okay to just do that really quick after Thank you've you. tied up the conversation so nicely and we're all about to run away? Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, so for folks who want to donate books to us, we accept paperback donations at our office. You can email us, um, asheprisonbooks at gmail.com. We've got our website, which uh, Ash put in the chat, ablpb.org. Um, 
We love volunteers. We have monthly volunteer events every third Sunday of the month from 1 to 3 p.m. The location sometimes changes, but it's always third Sunday of the month, 1 to 3 p.m. We gather to package up the books. Um, it's really fun. It's social. It's, it's a low-key way to help out. Um, we also can train you to fill the requests, which is really, especially if you're interested in this kind of work, um, getting to actually open the letters and read them and select books for people. Uh, people find that very, um, very immersive. Um, and we do need money. <laughs> um, so if you can, uh, if you have the means to consider a donation, um, postage is always, always going up. Um, so that, that keeps us going. <laughs> right, that's Awesome. I, oh, can I just also say my thanks? I just want to say thanks also to everybody, um, Scott, particularly for being in this dialogue, Ash for hosting, uh, Julie and Julian for your testimony and sharing about prison books programs. Julian, I was particularly moved to hear you speak. And, uh, and, and to my colleague Moira, who's in the background, who put this all together and gave us some real food for thought to chat about tonight. I want to say also two things. One, teach this book. If you teach writing on the outside, it also positions writers with justice involvement as legitimate contributors to, to, the, to the dialogue on writing. I mean, the book is beautifully written across the board. I mean, funny, deep, highly readable. Um, I think that's another way to kind of be in the conversation, even if you're not working behind the walls. And please support Asheville Prison Books. We are lucky to be a very uh, highly visible, well-resourced organization, thanks to you know the Mellon Foundation. But really, I think these more grassroots local organizations are, the, are really the unsung heroes of our field. And I just wanted to underscore that. If you have some couple bucks to throw their way, please do. Fantastic and well said. And yeah, I did drop, I dropped a link to the book as well as Asheville Prison Books uh, website in the chat there. So do hope folks will check them out if they haven't yet. Uh, we're getting folks in the chat now um, who are just thanking everyone for the event tonight. Uh, there's one more question. Is there a way to volunteer to be a writing mentor and work behind the walls? think we're gonna I can do a real quick answer of that Go for, um, for our, with our program we, we have um because of our visibility and longevity we have a highly competitive <laughs> volunteer program but we open applications once a year keep an eye on our social media for that or sign up for our monthly newsletter which is also has a podcast about a book connected to mass incarceration or prison work or liberation work pen.org backslash works of justice Justice Arts Coalition also does some amazing mentor work through the walls with writers and artists. Look them up. I think they actually have a, a larger capacity than we do. And there are a ton of informal programs happening everywhere. Uh, Pen Pal programs online, Black and Pink, that's not informal. <laughs> Black and Pink has an amazing Pen Pal service uh, working with particularly LGBTQ writers in prison. And uh, something we're really looking to do in the future, so also keep an eye out, is develop uh, toolkits to begin your own Through the Walls mentor training program in partnership with like a local bookstore, for example. So we don't have to be the conduit for everyone, but we share our best practices. So uh, you maybe start one and we'll give you some resources and materials for it. Uh, actually teaching inside prisons is a little harder. If you don't have a local organization, you can tap into, approach, approach your local prison, the warden or the education director, and good luck to you. <laughs> That's a short answer, but there's a, some, some inroads there. Hmm. All right, y'all. I hope you have a good night. You too. See you. Good night. Bye now. Thanks again.